All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you for jumping on and joining us. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the key to building brand trust, sharing and leveraging the story of on-farm innovation um, from the Center for Food Integrity and with the support from the United Soybean Board. Uh, we appreciate you taking time to learn more about how food companies can leverage this important story, multiple stories that exist uh, for what's going on today on today's farms, to be able to build credibility in your brands and ultimately earn consumer trust. So today, um, I'm Roxy Beck and uh, Director of Consumer Engagement with the Center for Food Integrity, um, but I'm going to be joined by Erica Lane, who's a soybean and livestock farmer from Cordon, Iowa. Uh, she's Sustainability Manager at Iowa Select Farms, which is the fourth largest pork producer in the United States. And you'll also be hearing from Lance Rizak, a, a soybean and livestock farmer um, and a United Soybean Farmer leader from Onega, Kansas. Both are going to be sharing some specific examples of how their on-farm innovations are really coming to life and how some of these are the stories that you um, being involved with food companies or any place throughout the supply chain can really start to understand what's going on so that those can be leveraged as you work to build trust. During this webinar, we're going to delve into several different elements um, just to sort of set the stage. The first will be the erosion of trust and why some consumers today don't trust our food system. Um, the increased interest in sustainability, including not only Center for Food Integrity research, that which was sponsored by United Soybean Board, our own research, as well as um, some others that really showcase this heightened focus um, especially by the younger generations that are coming into uh, buying power and decision making. We'll look at CFI's consumer trust model and particularly farmer trust and what's going on there in terms of the consumer dynamics today. And then we're going to hear directly again from Erica and Lance to share what's going on, highlighting their family legacies, the innovations that are going on both in crops and livestock farming today. And then finally, we'll jump into how do we take all of this information and detail some specific strategies for earning trust with the marketplace. So first and foremost, a little bit about CFI if you haven't been exposed to our work. We are a non-for-profit organization and our sole mission is to help today's food system earn consumer trust. And we do think of the food system as a big, united, but diverse and choice-filled uh, or a system. Um, we really do feel we're the leading neutral voice of the integrated food system, and we are a catalyst for building trust across the entire food value chain. We do have more than 200 members and project partners that span from FarmGate um, to the world's largest retailers, restaurant chains, food manufacturers, and it allows us to provide our members with a deep network of experts, um, connections, tools, and industry-leading resources. If you're interested in learning more about CFI, you can do so at foodintegrity.org. We firmly believe as well that trust is an organization's most valuable yet intangible asset. And in today's volatile and rapidly changing environment, um, you've seen this, we've seen this, this is even more challenging to earn and maintain over time. So when um, and why have we seen an erosion of the trust? Um, we really believe society's perspective of the food system has been shaped over time. And so to look forward, we feel it's really helpful to look backwards. A year that we landed on um, was 1968, and there was a ton going on in our society. Over those last 50 plus years, there have been some major fundamental shifts in the way that people look at industries, institutions, or anything that's highly consolidated or integrated. Prior um, to this pivotal time, uh, the late 60s, authority was granted primarily by the office that was held. So if you were a community official, a governor, a CEO, you automatically were granted respect. But today, it's not the case. Respect is earned, and it's granted primarily by relationships. So the public first wants to know that you're a person they can trust before they're going to trust that which you're affiliated with. Um, it used to be that broad social consensus was driven by white Anglo-Saxon Protestant men or WASP males. And today, there just really isn't a single social consensus. There's a huge amount of diversity, many voices, and they're coming from all, all corners of the globe. It used to be, again, thinking back to what's what are these major shifts, it used to be that communication was very formal and indirect. Um, we had information that was being pushed by masses, excuse me, to the masses by just a few information sources. So we moved from mass communication now to masses of communicators. 
where our information that's coming across is very informal, it's fast, and it's coming from masses of people who are directly involved with what's going on. And when you think about the explosion of cable networks, um, the internet, the digital communication age, this allows everyone to have a voice versus maybe the three primary television networks or the newspaper that landed on your front doorstep, you know, in, in the 50 years ago. It also used to be that progress was inevitable. Um, it was exciting. We could put a man on the moon. Um, if we could do something in the name of efficiency, productivity, progress, um, even maximization of profit, we did that, and especially within the food supply chain, as we saw the need to feed, you know, a growing global population um, and move people away from subsistence agriculture. And now today, progress continues to be possible, but there are real questions about should we really go there? People aren't ready to um, fully allow the industry to move at the pace that it did years and years ago. They want to know about the risks. They want to know about who ultimately is benefiting from this thing that you're calling progress. And they don't really know how to consume all that information, especially as new technologies and advancements come into play. The other um, consideration too, is if it's technology that I assume will go into my body, uh, that is far more risky than something that I think empowers, for example, a farmer to do their job. So when we're talking about drones versus GMOs, there are very, very different perceptions of what that means and how much innovation and technology should be allowed. Finally, it used to be that institutions were respected. If your company was growing, it was prospering, that was something to be celebrated, and you were allowed to grow because you had done great things. But today, there's a perception that larger companies and this big industry is focused more on profit. So when you think about what's happened over this last 50 years, um, we can then ask the question, so what's happened in agriculture in the same time, and specifically the broader food system? How are people looking to that when they think about all of the change that's happened socially? So when we think about the changes that have happened over those 50 years, think about the consolidation and integration and industrialization that's been had and was necessary to meet consumer demands and to meet the way that our society wanted to work. Um, we've become more efficient to keep these businesses running, um, and to do so, they've become big. There is a big um, consensus that big food or big agribusiness is out of touch with the values of consumers, and perhaps what's happening is profit is being put ahead of public interest. And when you see images like this put in popular business media, that here are the 10 companies that are controlling everything you buy, and many of those are food brands or brands that have a portfolio including food, then people really have a hard time uncoupling what it is they think they know from what they can see through evidence like this. So food brands certainly are under a lot of pressure today. Um, think about all the other realities that we're, we're re dealing with now, supply chain issues, rising fuel and food costs, social issues that are you know, under a microscope at this point and being closely watched by this evolving consumer with their preferences. And they're looking at a whole host of attributes that go well beyond um, the standard check marks that used to be in place with price, taste, convenience, even food quality. Those will exist, those will continue to be important, but there's a whole host of other considerations that people are um, putting through their uh, own minds to ensure that they're buying food that's trustworthy. As I said, I wanted to give you some additional research that we've seen in the marketplace that really helps us understand what's going on around trust um, and later around farmer um, perceptions. So this recent study was done uh, by Morning Consult and it's one of the many um, that are showing an uptick in the interest in sustainability and also showing there's a volatility in trust. Um, this study found that seven in 10 um, trust food and beverage, that category, but while consumers tend to have a long-term relationship with brands, they're not afraid to switch um, when that trust wanes. The report noted that one in three consumers said they have switched uh, food and beverage brands more than any other industry that Morning Consult uh, reviewed, including um, automotive, financial, e-commerce, retail, travel, and hospitality. Um, and many of the factors that can cause uh, consumers to lose trust um, or confidence in a brand include a decline in product quality, um, an increase in price, or the fact that the the brand stood for a cause they disagree with. Um, that is definitely happening today as, as consumers are expecting that brands will stand up for social issues as much as they will stand up for things like food quality, food safety, et cetera. 
So this brand loyalty for food and beverage industries is especially pronounced amongst baby boomers and high-income consumers. Um, when we look at the trust among younger consumers, um, this, this is in decline. Um, respondents also were asked which attributes they ranked as the most important. And baby boomers reported um, the, the good value for price. Um, so, you know, there's always that price in there. Uh, quality products and service are provided, and they're done so uh, delivering uh, consistent with the promises that have been made by that brand. While Gen Z adults and millennials also said, yep, value for price, quality and service, and, you know, their promises are, are delivered on, they also said they um, include good customer service and the customer reviews that they can find, especially in so many different crowdsourced applications today, as well as sustainability. So while two-thirds of consumers trust food and beverage brands, their loyalty can be fleeting based on how they see marketing, based on how they see companies stand up or not. Um, and these issues are, are, are shifting over time. So in this environment, as you might guess, trust can be lost quickly. Um, some brands are taking notice and promoting their sustainability efforts, and they're doing this in multiple ways and in, for different attributes. Um, packaging, maybe the resources that are used, the ingredients that are sourced. Um, these are different things that we're seeing companies market and um, brand, but kind of weave into their branding to say we're paying attention to these issues. We know, too, as younger generations become an even bigger source of revenue, um, millennials and Gen Zs together make up almost 45% of the buying power uh, of, of the population, and, and they're going to be coming into power as they age. Um, but CPGs have obviously taken notice, and for good reason. Um, this is why they're really taking this along with other pressures, including investors are paying great attention to this. But this is why they feel it's important to promote sustainability efforts for all of these different things like changing uh, potentially the type of packaging or reducing water use or, again, sourcing ingredients that are sustainable. Um, it's also a reason they're more engaged online than ever before um, because they know that younger consumers, all consumers really, but younger consumers are going to be looking for evidence in multiple places and they're definitely going to be doing so um, through their mobile devices. I will say uh, Google has met that point where more than all than 50% of all um, internet users are doing so on mobile. And so they've changed their algorithms. They've changed preference for how companies who have um, really web optimized, um, excuse me, mobile optimized websites and platforms are going to be given preference simply because of the vast majority of users now, more than 50% are doing so on a mobile device. Another great study that was completed this year um, by, was by IFIC, the International Food Information Council. And among the topics that they covered, this survey examined the food priorities and the buying power of specifically Generation Z. And they also looked at um, overall in Americans' concern about environmental sustainability. Um, when asked whether they believe their generation was more concerned about environmental impacts of their food choices than other generations, Gen Z was the most likely to say yes at 73%, and then millennials very close behind at 71%. And among all age groups, 39% said environmental sustainability had an impact on their purchase, purchasing decisions across the food and beverage um, sectors. This was up 27% from 2019. So it's a big darn deal that people are turning their attention to this. Certainly some of that could be because food companies and industries are talking more about it as you know, the topic of climate change has become more front and center in all sorts of media and you know, consumer-focused media. Um, but that in turn is making people say, this is something I'm looking for as I examine what I'm gonna put into my cart and ultimately into my mouth. So a lot of, a lot of information and little tidbits there. How do we trust, um, how do we earn trust in a shifting environment? Um, one of the things we know to be true about trust building is what we learned um, in our trust model um, that was developed several years ago um, in partnership with Dr. Sapp at Iowa State University. Um, this is based on peer-reviewed and published research, and the trust model shows us that there are three factors that are going to help us earn trust, which in turn give us social license, the, the public permission that's going to drive our freedom to operate. The first is influential others. Influential others are those people and experts that we trust and go to and seek their opinions on different topics. Um, this is really important that uh, we have all um, people that are involved in the food system talking about what we know and, how, and what's really important to us. Um, the other two factors that really drive trust are what Dr. Stapp called competence. This is the facts, the science, the data, 
frankly, this is what we love in food and agriculture, because when we have good data, good metrics, and we can research over time, then we can make really good decisions that help us balance what's the right thing to do, what scientifically are we being you know, shown is the right thing to do, and economically, how does this all fit together? Um, so competence is really important. Um, the second type of information that should be shared by those influential others then is what Dr. Sapp called confidence or a perception of shared values. Are you a person like me? Do you value and hold dear the same things I do? Do we have the same passions or interests? Um, when you think about those things that are outside of price, taste, convenience, this is, does this, does this company have a mind for the social issues that I care about? Are they concerned about environmental challenges and are they actually demonstrating they're doing something, not just saying it's important? So when we put that all together, um, the reality of this research is we know what drives information, but, or excuse me, we know what drives trust, but at the, the end of the day, those two types of information are gonna help us get to that outcome. And what we learned through that trust research and model was that shared values, the perception that I'm a person like you, the consumer, shared values are three to five times more important than the competence or the facts that you can share. So said a little bit differently, facts, data, research is three to five times less important in sh to share with consumers than just showcasing who we are, who, you know, what, what is important to all of these people in the food system um, to then help them understand, okay, and here's how we're getting this done. If we don't first showcase who we are and what's important, we're going to very, be very unlikely to be heard um, when we bring those facts to the fore. So this is something important for everyone that's involved in the food system to understand. We have to have facts and data. I didn't say throw them away, but if that's all we have, we also lose because consumers are looking for a direct relationship-based connection with the brands they're interacting with. And this may sound familiar. The creator of the Golden Circle, Simon Sinek, um, says people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And so, therefore, to tell an effective story for marketing, um, we should always start with why. And farmer suppliers, um, they can serve as that why. They can represent what you stand for as a brand and how they are actually helping you make good on the brand promises that you have, especially those that are around sustainability, improvement, technology, innovation that suit the needs and the goals of this consumer marketplace. So when we think about who has trust today, what our research has shown is absolutely farmers hold that trust. Um, one of the uh, kind of pieces to understand is that consumers may not actually trust farming. They may see pictures of what today's agriculture looks like and go, I'm not really comfortable with that. I've never experienced that. Um, but they do trust farmers. They do understand there's a values-based connection. There's a legacy and a heritage and definitely family values that, that help those in, in farming um, have the best interest at heart. Um, and at a time when sustainability is driving governmental policy, um, the choices of many stakeholders, consumers, customers, investors, others, food companies really can help build their sustainability success story by starting at the farm gate. So knowing more, uh, excuse me, knowing that more consumers are interested in sustainability and technology, um, touting the innovation and environmental practices used on today's farms actually can build credibility and trust for those brands. And this is true for, you know, companies that are sourcing meat, milk, eggs, grains, spices, as well as sourcing feed for the livestock, poultry, fish, um, that and ultimately ends up in consumers' carts. Um, CFI's annual research, which has been conducted for more than a decade, has consistently shown that consumers trust farmers, and the good standing of farmers presents a real um, positive opportunity for food companies to leverage this, what we're calling the farmer, farmer halo, to earn trust. Um, in our 2021 study, which again was uh, conducted with the support of the United Soybean Board, nearly two thirds, 62% of US consumers said they have a very positive or somewhat positive impression of US agriculture today. Um, millennials and early adopters, those who are actively researching um, and, and showing information, they're more positive than that even. So that's a really good sign for us that they're looking for that. Um, we see similar results here. Two out of three have a very positive or somewhat positive impression of the use of technology to grow food in the United States. And again, similar theme, millennials and early adopters are even more, po more positive. Early adopters being those who seek multiple sources of information. They favor science and data. Um, they vote. <laughs> they look to form an opinion from multiple sources. 
understand, you know, not only here's the, the recommendation, but here's some data to support it. And then they, they share that information. So having them be um, positive about the leveraging of, of new technologies and innovative thinking for what's going on the farm and throughout the food supply, as long as it matches with an in intended benefit for them, that's going to be really important for us to get right because um, they, they already have a positive impression and now we just need to showcase how that's being done today. Um, the findings of the CFI research were also reinforced by Gallup polls over the recent years. Um, during a time we've all lived through and seen, we have experienced some major changes related to the food supply um, with the pandemic and, um, you know, global supply chain issues that were a result of that, now war. Um, but on an annual basis, overall, Gallup reports um, on consumer perspectives of different U.S. business sectors. And as we look from 2019, 2020 to 2021, we have some, seen some major shifts in whether business sectors are seen as positive or not. And in the 2020 farming and agriculture, uh, 2020 study, excuse me, um, the industry of farming and agriculture outranked every other industry in the survey with 69% of consumers giving it either a very or somewhat positive ranking. Um, additionally, the grocery and industry, grocery industry came in at 63% and the restaurant industry at 61. So looking year over year, well, the numbers for those three industries connected to food have declined now in, tw in 2021 as of their last uh, reporting. They're still far more positive than most other industries. So at the end of the day, um, all sectors tested, farming and agriculture is still one with very, very high positive rankings. So again, it's a fast pathway to say, we are aligned with this industry, um, and here's how we're, we're connected, we're partnering to benefit all food that comes from it. The last little piece of research that I'll, I'll highlight here is that um, a, a study that looked at um, a difference between who consumers hold responsible versus uh, who, they, um, who they trust <laughs> in both of these were to ensure safe food. And what we found is there's clearly a disconnect. Um, you'll see lots of different entities, 11 different um, kind of types of people or categories of people that were named. Um, again, those who are held responsible to ensure safe food pay attention to the positioning of the farmers, number three, and equally matched, they are trusted to ensure safe food at that number three. Um, and we see that status is not necessarily shared by others who have a direct impact on the safety of food. We also took this same research and asked the question about um, who, who do we hold responsible to ensure healthy food and who do we trust to ensure safe food. And the results were very, very um, similar, showing that people are not disconnecting safe food from healthy food, perhaps in the ways that we as industry people have um, for, for decades. Um, so important to understand that too. So this consistent theme, again, um, we, we see that farmers can actually play a really important role in communicating the care that's going into farming. Um, and for that, I want to um, hear directly from a couple of farmers, um, soybean farmers that we've got on the line here today. And the first is Lance. Um, Lance, we'd love for you to tell us a bit about your farm, your family, uh, what you grow and raise, and the sustainable practices used on your farm. Well, hello everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, yeah, on my farm is in a, next to a small town, Onega, and it's about two hours straight west of Kansas City for people on a national view. Um, I spend a lot of time, I actually volunteer on our Kansas Soybean Commission and the United Soybean Board, who's hosting me this for this webinar. And then I've also been fortunate enough to uh, serve as one of the four farmers uh, on the U.S. Soy Export Council for USB. And so uh, that gives me a chance to even visit with a lot of international customers who buy our food and buy our Even for them, sustainability is a is a is an important issue for them, even in developing countries where you wouldn't think it might be. So sustainability is a big deal. Um, today, I'm mostly going to focus on the technology that makes us more sustainable, um, but we also have a, 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 a cow herd and a swine herd here in Kansas. Um, I am a fifth generation farmer, and I farmed with my dad until he passed away, and my brother. And now I farm my brother, but we're fortunate enough to have the sixth generation farming with us. Uh, it's my son and daughter and two other sons also farm together. And so the top left picture is, is my daughter. She actually has a master's degree from Kansas State University in agronomy, and she's a certified crop advisor. So 
her and I have some good conversations about what's going on with the crops out there and the technology we need to use. Uh, the bottom left picture is a picture of my son and daughter. He graduated with a degree in uh, ag business. And then the picture on the right is my brother and one of his sons. Uh, you might guess by their hats which area of the uh, farm they take care of. They take care of the cattle. And so uh, we each have our own individual uh, places that we take care of. And um, anyway, so so with with the fifth, sixth generation, you can tell it's really important for us to be sustainable in everything we do. And so we're always continually uh, trying to be more efficient, more sustainable uh, along the way. Uh, some of the things we grow, like I said, we are um, about two hours west of Kansas City. So that means our rainfall is OK for we can grow soybeans, corn, wheat, alfalfa, uh, grass, hay. Fun fact, the very western edge of Kansas gets about 18 inches of rainfall a year. The eastern Kansas gets 36, 38. There's a big difference in how you farm and how you uh, and the crops you grow as you move across Kansas. And luckily, we're more to the east where we've got more rainfall and, and a few more options that we can deal with. Uh, so anyway, then the next picture, um, I mentioned we have a fair to finish, which means birth to market. The pigs are born at our place. We have about 400 sows, so we sell about 8,000 pigs a year, and um, and it's an integral part of how we're sustainable with our uh, with our uh, nutrient management from the from the hogs. The picture on the left is just uh, some pigs we had loaded up. We have another farmer who actually helps finish some of the pigs for us and grow them up. But so those were on their way to his place. Uh, the picture in the middle has my granddaughter checking out the pigs in our nursery. I guess she's making sure her mother's doing a good job raising the pigs for us. And then the picture on the right, um, that area, those are actually cover crops you see there. We harvested winter wheat there, which we do that the 1st of July. And then um, we hauled manure to that area because it was a low it was a low area in the field and it needed more fertility. So we moved, we hauled the manure there and then we planted, those are oats and radishes. And then we planted oats and radishes there. And then we let the cattle graze them that fall. And they were, there was a lot more cattle up close to them to take the picture. They're all kind of scattered. So uh, that's what's going on there with our, with our cover crops and our cattle and grazing. We try to utilize that whenever we can, too. Uh, this photo is actually my home farm. I live there. Um, my house is kind of up in the middle, right by all the grain bins. You can't hardly see it. But um, and then to the left, you can see some hog lagoons over there. Some of them are what we call two-stage lagoons. Yeah, the ones that the circle just lit up on. Those are two-stage lagoons. So all the manure flows into the first lagoon and, and the more the nutrients and they settle out there. And then the fresh water moves on to the second lagoon. And we have a pump over there that actually recirculates water back up through the hog barns and washes the manure back out into the first lagoon. So it just circles around. And then when we get ready to haul manure, we haul it out of the first lagoon because that's where all the more solids and nutrients are. And then uh, down in the left corner here, I think you can see there's a bunch of bales. Those are actually brome hay bales. Those will be fed for the cattle. Um, we put up a lot of hay. Um, over on the, I don't know if you can see at the bottom right corner, there's some hoops and more hay bales. Those are straw bales. We use those for bedding on the hogs. Uh, we, we, we take all our grain home and we make, make our own feed for the pigs and the cattle. And so, uh, and then, so then there's some sheds for storage in there too. Plus, we actually have some pigs that are outside in dirt lots yet, too. And that's kind of the dirt you see there in the middle of the photo. Okay, next. This, uh, this photo is, is my daughter. She's our technology lead here at the farm. Um, you can kind of see a silver T handle there in the, by the bucket and a Polaris. This is how we grid sample our ground now. We go out and uh, she does it with GPS. She stops in the same spot. We do it about every four years. And, and she takes 10 cores, she goes around it in that little T-handle, it actually takes about a one inch sample across and six inches deep, we always sample six inches to get the top, top nutrients. And then we take 10 of them in an area, one little spot, and then we send them in and get it analyzed as to how our, how our nutrition and the, and the ground is doing. And uh, I got a slide here a little later, I'll talk a little more about that. And the picture on the right, that's that's one of our hog lagoons. And that was my daughter. Again, she was in the tractor stirring. You can kind of see some metal going down into the water. There's a propeller on there. And, and I talked about the one lagoon has settles it out. So we want to stir it up and get all those nutrients mixed up in the in the water again. And on the upper right corner, you can see there's a spout and a semi-tanker. 
we load it in semi tankers and we take it to the field and we put it in the in the right field in the right area that needs that needs that specific nutrition from the hog manure. It's it's really good stuff. This uh, this photo here on the left it looks busy but it's not. It's just a field of ours, and uh, and the numbers on the left are where my daughter stopped with her Polaris. Each one sample one two three four five, and she stopped at all them places. Now when I graduated from college. I would go to this same field and I would go out there and I would pull random samples throughout the field because that's all we could do. We could manage it on a field level. And so I would go out there and I'd drive around and I'd get an average for that field. I've always had the ability to send it into a lab and get it analyzed for what nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, uh, pH, cation exchange. We, we've always been able to monitor our soil pretty well, but we couldn't do it on an individual basis. But now she goes out there, takes all these samples. Each sample is about as big as two football fields. And this field is, well, 60 acres is about a half mile long and about a quarter mile wide. So I used to be able to manage the field. Now we can manage it almost down to a football size field. And then the, the picture on the right actually shows an uh, application uh, thing that she would put in our fertilizer spreader, or we can haul manure out there either way. And the areas and even the areas, they don't all need the same amount. Some need none, some need a little bit, some need more. And so we can adjust uh, as we go across that field, the spread for laser spreader automatically puts exactly the right amount on in exactly the right area. It's just really phenomenal how well this works. Okay. Uh, this shows our planner here. Um, the top left corner, we were, uh, we were trying to beat a rainstorm behind the planner. I don't think we really did, but I was still trying that day. The black box you see is full of soybean seed and it's in bulk and we put it in the planner. And then the planner nowadays has the ability to go out and the picture in the bottom right is what we call our swath control. The rows running lengthways up and down your screen, that's our turn rows where we went around the field. And then when it used to be, when you pulled in with your planner, you would have to plant the full width of the planner. And then when you raise the planner up, it quit planting. Well, nowadays with GPS and swath control, you can see it shut every single row off at the correct time. The first year where I put that on my planner, we sent 10% of our seed back. We had enough overlap and, and, and double planting is really what it was. It doesn't hurt anything other than the pocketbook, but we had double planted corn and beans. And so we saved 10% of our seed that, that first year. And then there's other little technology things that are coming along for corn, actually. The other day, I just signed up to get our, ni our nitrogen is the main fertilizer that corn needs nitrogen. And uh, they usually make it with nit natural gas. Well, I signed up and in 2024, I should be able to start getting anhydrous ammonia, the nitrogen fertilizer that's made with wind power now. So it's going to be carbon neutral. We won't use any natural gas to make a fertilizer. So things like this keep happening along. Uh, we also tried some microbial, uh, some microbes that live on the corn root and the corn root, the microbes need the corn root to live, but then the microbes give off nitrogen for the corn root. And uh, there's science behind it. It should have worked, but it really didn't for us this year. So we might have to tweak that a little. But there's all these advancements coming along that just keep keep you keep you uh, you know just give give you a reason to get up in the morning. Uh, here again, um, I kind of talked about how dry it gets in Kansas. So we no-till just everything we can possibly no-till. The top left corner is soybeans no-tilled and corn stubble. So the year before we harvest the corn stubble, and then we'll come in and if we need fertilizer. Or or whatever we need to do and we'll kill the weeds and then uh and then we plant directly into that corn stubble and then the bottom picture on the left is corn that's planted in soybean stubble and we want to leave that mulch on the ground for a couple of reasons one you know when when the it's kind of like mulching your garden if you have gardens you know it keeps the soil cooler underneath it keeps it moisture underneath and then when it does rain the rain actually gets some of the energy gets absorbed by the residue and it doesn't just splash your ground and so it kind of helps control erosion and then the picture on the right is my granddaughter out again. Uh, she's checking our residue levels, apparently. She's got a corn stalk in her hand there to make sure we left enough corn, corn stalk uh, residue on the ground there. Okay. Next. There we go. Um, and in, in this country, I mentioned we grow wheat, hard red winter wheat, and we're actually planting it today right now we're starting to plant wheat we plant wheat in the fall and it grows in the fall a little bit it goes dormant in the winter and then 
next spring it comes out and, and, and we harvest it at the end of June or first of July. And so this is some harvested wheat stubble. We've gone out there. And so we harvest it, like I said, at the end of June. I like to have a green growing root in my ground anytime it's not frozen. I want something growing there. And so we put soybeans in this one. And, and they actually, they have a pretty good chance of doing well. They'll, they'll do maybe half or two thirds of good as your full season soybeans that you plant in April because they don't have as long to grow. But, uh, but they, keep, they keep a good growing root. They'll put a little nitrogen in your soil. And so uh, we, we double crop either with soybeans or some hay or something in that ground to keep a root in it. And the picture on the right was actually, those are corn stalks that have been uh, cut for silage. You can tell they're only five, six inches tall. And there again, we went in and we no-tilled some, uh, some cover crops in. That's a rye and turnips in that one in the fall. Uh, and we want to keep some growing and then we'll graze cattle on those again too. So uh, anyway, this is just some of the technology and in some ways we're incorporating uh, new innovations all the time in our field and the next generation, they're just, they're just so much better at it and they have so much more ability to do this with GPS and precision ag that we didn't even dream of. I always told somebody when I graduated from college, I wanted to farm enough to play with the coolest toys and this technology we have are the coolest toys. It's just amazes me what we can do. And so uh, we came a long ways and uh, I just look forward to seeing what's happening next. My grandpa would be amazed at what we do now compared to when he farmed with horses. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Lance. Um, obviously you are doing so many different things in the name of sustainability and we'll say not solely because of the next generation, you know, your daughter and, and the grand <laughs> are making some really great progress, but we appreciate that. If you do have any questions, um, you know, go ahead and drop those in the chat box and we'll have uh, an opportunity potentially to get to those if we see some questions come through. Next up is Erica Lane, and we'll hear directly from her again. Thank you uh, to Lance, but now we introduce Erica. Um, go ahead and tell us a bit about your family and the work that you're focused on now. Thank you, Roxy. Next slide, please. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to be in front of you all today. As Roxy mentioned, my name is Erica Lane, and I am a wife, a mother, a farmer, and the sustainability manager here at Iowa Select Farms. Next slide, please. My, I grew up in Eastern Iowa on a beef cattle and a row crop farm where we raised corn and soybeans uh, just uh, in Makokata there. And then I actually went to Iowa State and studied animal science. And that is where I met my husband. Uh, and now we live in Southern Iowa. If you click one more time, Roxy you will see a star that kind of shows exactly where we farm just straight south of Des Moines there, almost into Missouri. And on our farm, we uh, also have beef cattle and we also have uh, corn and soybeans. Um, and so we're really fortunate enough to be able to uh, raise my son the same way that we were raised. And a few of the, the few things that we love um, as we continue to grow up here on our farm in Southern Iowa, is um, hearing him say moo every time he sees the cows or playing tractors on our living room carpet. And so we're really fortunate enough to, to grow them uh, up the same way we are raised. And so we are sustaining our family farm uh, now and for the next generation. And we're able to do that by raising our food responsibly through ensuring the proper nutrition for our animals, making sure we have antibiotic stewardship, and that we instill uh, new technology and precision agriculture on our fields. We also can do this by improving our soil health and taking care of our natural resources, such as the use of hog manure, um, the use of cover crops. As you can see there on the third photo, uh, we implement waterways. We also implement reduced tillage, which is a lower disturbance to our soils. And lastly, through involving the youth. And as, as you can see up here in the photos, uh, it's a big family affair on our farm as we ensure all of our nieces and nephews and my son as well uh, gets to see what we do every day to ensure they have the same opportunities um, when they get to grow up. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned earlier, I also work for Iowa Select Farms as their sustainability manager. So who is Iowa Select? We are a privately owned uh, haul company here based in Iowa. 
We are owned by Jeff and Deb Hansen, and we are celebrating 30 years of being in production this year. We are headquartered in Iowa Falls, Iowa, with 242,000 sows, over 800 farms. We market just uh, over 5 million hogs on an annual basis, making us the fourth largest bird producer in the United States. And why are, we, why are we based here solely in Iowa? Well, if you look at the soil map on the globe, Iowa is one of the most fertile soils um, in the entire world. And what a better place to raise hogs where we can source corn and soybeans uh, to feed our pigs. Next slide, please. And so our mission here at Iowa Select is to responsibly produce safe, nutritious, and high quality pork for our customers and the food companies they serve. And we're able to do this through our select care core values, through ensuring we take care of our people, our animals, the environment, and the communities that we live and work in. And this is truly the uh, foundation of how we've started our sustainability uh, efforts here at Iowa Select Farms. And for uh, the time's sake today, I will just highlight quickly the animal care portion and the environmental care portion. And so our goal is to humanely raise healthy and productive animals in a safe and comfortable uh, environment. And so we have a production well-being team of nine full-time staff and their core responsibilities are to conduct all of our internal unannounced uh, production well-being and biosecurity assessments to ensure all of the training is done here at Iowa Select Farms and that all of our employees and truck drivers are certified through the National Board Board. We also have external audits done three times per quarter on our farms. And our goal is to achieve an average score of 97% or higher on these um, external audits. And we were able to achieve this in 2021. We also have six full-time veterinarians. Uh, one, thank you. We also have six full-time veterinarians on staff here at Iowa Select Farms. And um, we ensure that they have a relationship with all of our farms, our managers, and our, and our supervisors to ensure that we are following the FDA guidelines and to give proper care to our animals every single day. Next slide, please. Now, lastly, I'm gonna highlight our environment care pillar. And so our goal is to steward our natural resources through innovation and technology. We have 10 full-time staff uh, workers in our environment department, and they oversee our manure management plans, uh, working with 1,700 soybean and corn farmers throughout the state of Iowa, and help advance soil health on over 160,000 acres on an annual basis. And we just recently released a third-party sustainability analysis conducted with our manure customers up in the Raccoon River watershed uh, located in Iowa. And we were able to collect over 14,000 acres of agronomic data to understand multiple environmental outcomes um, based up in that area. And the one that I'd like to highlight is our solar erosion rate. On our fields that received hog manure and the conservation practices that they employed, we had a nine times less erosion rate on our fields versus the Iowa average. So we were at 0.64 tons per acre versus the Iowa average at 5.9 tons per acre. Next slide, please. And so based off of that, we really want to uh, continue these efforts under the environment care pillar. And so we've launched our Smart Soil Partnerships Program. And this program is to outline all of our manure operations uh, to ensure that we are applying our manure responsibly. It's also a way for us to recognize farmers that receive our manure, but also employ those conservation practices for continuous improvement. It's also a way for us to continue to involve programs that further protect our water quality, sequester carbon, and ultimately improve soil health with those soybean and corn farmers throughout the state of Iowa. Next slide, please. So with that, I would like to say thank you for this opportunity. And if you have any more questions around what we do on our family farm or what we do here at Iowa Select Farms, please feel free to reach out to me on my email or look at our uh, sustainability report online at that website that you see on the screen. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much, um, Erica, as well. It's, it's obvious that farming today has changed drastically for anybody that has had exposure over decades or in the case of these families, multiple generations. 
Um, it certainly feels different and it absolutely has opportunity for those that are directly involved in the food system to leverage stories like Erica's and Lance's. You heard a lot of the, here's what we're doing and here's why we're doing it. So we wanna give you some strategies for how do we leverage this? How can those throughout the supply chain um, take what's happening on the farm and actually put them to work for your strategies? One of the first questions you should be asking is, do you know your farmer suppliers? So step one should be collaboration. If you don't know who they are, start to understand through your supply chain um, where, where, the, where they're located, how what they're doing is definitely supporting those end goals that consumers are interested in. Um, food companies don't often know what's happening on suppliers' farms, and farmers don't have a full understanding of the challenges or pressures that food companies are facing. And through collaboration and conversation, um, this is where some of that um, understanding is going to be fostered, but also those, those stories are going to be um, uniquely told. Um, certainly, figuring out what is distinct and differentiated from one farm to the next the types of innovations that are being leveraged, the uniquenesses that are brought forth by the different personalities that are involved. Um, it's, there's so many opportunities to tell these fun stories in a way that's also focusing on those end goals. And we do recommend creating an ongoing communication loop with farmer suppliers because this is going to enable your team to understand what happens in each season and the many decisions that are happening and made throughout the process. Um, the outcomes of their efforts are those things that you're interested in, but knowing those um, different pieces and parts that they're working through is going to be important. And ultimately, engaging long-term will empower brands to tell these well-informed stories of sustainability. Um, the other reality is consumers um, don't have a lot of context for what's going on on farms, so we have to break down the information in a way that's simple and relatable to the decisions of the consumer. So we can tie technology farmers are using today to the technology consumers are using. We're all on phones, iPads, you know, all these technological devices, and, and farmers are too. Um, you heard Lance talk about the precision nature, whether it's um, a sprayer or a planter, to ensure that we're not wasting resources. Um, these are done to monitor feed, to, to monitor water, climate, um, flying drones over a field. We are wearing Fitbits to monitor our health in the same way that farmers are monitoring the health of their crops, um, as well as of the animals, the livestock that they're, they're caring for. We take vitamins and supplements for specific health needs, and farmers use fertilizers and crop protection products to ensure the health of their plants. Um, we have, even in this state, I'm, I'm in Iowa as well, and we have no mow may to help with pollinator habitat. Farmers don't till their ground in order to keep their soil healthy. So there are some of these you know, analogies that can be leveraged to say, this is something that we're doing as consumers. Here's how it relates to something that's going on with the farming and agriculture community. Another strategy is to consider partnering with advocacy groups um, with sustainability goals. Again, it's collaboration, collaboration. Um, gather around the table, talk about sustainability, share the on-farm sustainability story, stories of your suppliers. Um, there are groups like the Nature Conservancy and World Wildlife Fund and Environmental Defense Fund, even Gates Foundation, that are thinking about and partnering with, you know, allies throughout the supply chain because they have a specific end mind and goal, and leveraging the unique um, influence of farmers can help them get to their goals. And the, the many issues that think differently about um, traditional partnerships, think about many issues that different advocacy works, uh, groups are working on, nutrition, animal well-being, worker health and safety, um, lots of things around food, affordability, accessibility, safety, and of course, environmental sustainability as we think about broader impacts. But lots of different ways that we can think about forming partnerships with groups that have an end goal in mind with us in food and agriculture. Um, and, uh, you know, empowering others to tell farmer stories. There was a time when companies communicated via television, radio, print, um, either paid or earned. And it's just really different today because there are so many influential voices um, that even have a greater reach and a more personalized reach um, through their own social channels. Um, so thinking about who you can engage to tell the so story of your farmer suppliers, give them that backstage pass, empower them to talk directly with subject matter experts, and trust that they'll do so in a way in telling those, those stories that's, you know, feet on the ground and em empowered and enabled by those who are directly involved. Um, we've done several of these influencer tours, um, just, um, very, um, they, they can seem a little bit difficult and like, wow, we're going to let somebody tell our story for us. 
Um, but there's a, a firm vetting process that we go through to ensure that the people that are invited really want to understand more about where food comes from and who are the people in this industry. Um, and once we've done that, you know, it results in millions and millions of consumers getting a sneak peek into what's happening, not only in food, you know, in, in the food growing and the people there, but the whole production process and distribution process. Um, we actually just in June hosted influencers on a taste tour um, that focused it, focused on soy in particular, and you can find all of that on Best Food Facts. Um, this was really focused on um, bringing in bloggers from all around the country, helping um, them understand and get that direct backstage pass. And they've done so with great credibility and authority in telling the stories of what are going on. So um, we want to thank you all. If there are, I'm not seeing any questions coming through um, the submit uh, content there. So I want to thank you all for your time and your participation today. Um, if there are any questions, please do uh, send those through to the Center for Food Integrity, um, or you can stay on here and, and drop those in. Um, additionally, there is a, a questionnaire. Uh, if you uh, would, would answer these three quick questions for us, you can link on the chat, uh, excuse me, you can click on the link that was just dropped into the chat box. And your feedback is very important as um, we plan for other webinars down the road. So please do take the time for that three question survey. And again, please let us know if there's any way that we can be helpful to you in answering questions or helping connect you through the supply chain uh, back to those farmers who are leading the, the charge on sustainability. We hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks again for your participation.